So you can, if you want to do the lectern or oh, the lectern. Whatever, oh, whatever you feel most Yeah, let's do a lectern. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me here this evening. It's been quite an interesting week in a way that I didn't quite anticipate when I accepted this gig um, a, a few months ago. Uh, so for those of you who, who don't know me, I, I'm an Oxford uh, alumni. I was an undergraduate in 19... I came up in 98. I was at St Hilda's College, graduated in 2001, uh, was president of Auzu, the other place, for a year, and uh, then did a couple of jobs here and there, but joined Stonewall in 2005. So I was 24 years old, 25 years old, to give you a sense of, of my lengthy career with, with Stonewall. So it's been quite amusing this week to see the speculation in the Sunday Times that I've kind of been fired in a, in a fit of disgrace. It's like, it's been 14 years. <laughs> like, I think it's okay, it's okay to go. And I'd always intended to do five years as, as chief executive. So it's quite nice to be here in this slightly reflective space. I've been slightly overwhelmed by the number of positive comments I've received, including things like, I can't believe I'll never hear Ruth Hunt speak again, which has wanted me to kind of say I've not actually died <laughs> and <laughs> it's possible I might, I might speak again in the future. But I, um, what I'm very acutely aware of is that it has been a significant period of change for LGBT people since I was even an undergraduate in 2001. So when I was uh, here in 2000, I wrote the um, LGBT handbook. I don't even know if you still have that now. In the LGBT handbook, the printer at the time refused to publish it because there was too much explicit content in that guide about, and it said simple things like, if you, if you fancy someone of the same sex, try kissing them. You know, like it was a really, really boring guide, to be honest. And kindly was trying to plug the gap, acknowledging that lots of young people came to university having never had any LGBT content. I came out when I was 13 years old. I read The Well of Loneliness and Orange is Not the Only Fruit. And for any uh, lesbians in the audience, you'll know those are the two worst possible books to read at 13 when you think you might be a lesbian. So by the time I got to Oxford at 18, St Hilda's College, a room of my own, a lock on the door. I mean, I was really ready to do gay in quite a major way. And, and I had a fantastic time, but it was still quite an uncomfortable time, I think, to be out. And I. Um, I was reflecting as I was here this afternoon about what the Union was to me then. And the Union was a place where, so, so you won't know, but when St Hilda's was a single sex college, we basically ran Oxford. So the president of the Union, the president of the Student Union, president of the Boat Club, president of the, you know, Churwell, they were all St Hilda's women, right? Like we kind of completely bossed it. But the Union was full of the girls with the long swishy hair and the long dresses. And there was no way that me as a little baby dyke with 20 Marlboro Lights, baggy jeans and number three haircut was going to do well in the, in the power struggle that was the union. And I'm sure it's much more, much more democratic now. But um, in my day, whew, um, you know, you, 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 if you even understood how to manage the slates, it, would be, it was a miracle. So I did the student union. I was president of my college and president of the student union. And in 2001, I was the first openly gay woman to hold the position of president of the student union. And it was very much weaponised as part of the election campaign against me. And it, it was, we were very much brought up. And I remember my mum saying very clearly, you will not get into Oxford if they know you're a lesbian. You will not get president of the student union if they know you're a lesbian. You will not get a job if it's known that you're a lesbian. And that kind of reflection on your career does leave a, leave a mark. And I like to think that now, in 2019, we've moved on. But I know for a lot of people... That isn't the case. So when I started at Stonewall in 2004, civil partnerships had just come in and we were beginning a big catalogue of legal changes. But my job was to change hearts and minds. And my job was to uh, develop the policy, research the education campaign. Some of you might have seen some people are gay get over it. Uh, that was on my watch. Um, so lots of different things in schools, lots of different things with sports, lots of things with health. And have seen a massive catalogue of changes culminating, I think, in 2014 with the introduction of trans into Stonewall. And in 2014, having done nine years, I said to the chair, I'll do five years, and what I'll do in those five years is bring trans in, increase our international work, and increase our sport, things like that. So I can talk at length about the stuff we've done, but what I want to share with you is my observations about where we're at before we open to more general questions. I think from certainly 2001 to 2014, the gay rights movement, and I use that word quite deliberately, was a fundamentally assimilationist movement. And what I mean by that is that we created a movement where if you were 
really what we'd call a good gay, you got on quite well. So if as a boy you weren't too camp, and as a woman you weren't too butch, and if you were trans and you looked good enough, you know, you were convincing enough, then you could be accepted. And the whole premise of the rights campaign was we want to get married just like you, we want to pay taxes just like you, we want to have children just like you, we want to be able to have slightly shady affairs and not talk about them just like you. you know, it, was, it was an absolute movement of, of similarity and sameness. And arguably, that was the single most effective thing that could be done. We are now the best country in the world for LGB rights, not T, but LGB rights. But what we lost in that was an ability to foster solidarity, um, communion with each other, friendliness to each other, a patience and a tolerance for things that were slightly different and odd. We were very excluding of bi people as a movement, for example. We didn't really understand people who didn't want to get married. Our grinder websites are still incredibly racist. Our movements and communities are very white. Our celebrities on the television look a certain way. We, we know what it is to be gay in a certain way. We can't really imagine people being good at sports and gay if you're a man. But if you're a girl, you can be good at sports, but only if you're, you know, you've got short hair. So we've, we've really narrowed ourselves down and restricted ourselves. So when in 2014 I said, I want to blow this open, I want to take... The corporates that we work with, we work with 750 corporates. My main people I work with are the security services, the Premier League football and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Those are my three kind of big clients. The conversations are exactly the same. Yes, you do have gay staff, Archbishop, you know. Yes, you do have gay players, Man United. Yes, you, you know, the conversations are the same. But getting them to think, well, what is non-binary identities? What is it to be a young Muslim lad trying who wants to play football and is also gay? You know, getting them to think beyond their peripheral vision. And that has been Stonewall's objective. And I think what we've come up against in that time is a resistance to widening out that acceptance without exception. And what I see is an increasing divide between a community who wants to stay very safe and a community who has the generosity of spirit to think beyond themselves. And to me, that is fundamental it's also fundamental to my faith, frankly. I'm, I'm, I'm openly Christian. I didn't realise that was something I had to be open about, but since I've become CEO, I'm open. The headline on The Independent was Practising Catholic Ruth Hunt becomes CEO of Stonewall. And I was like, oh, geez, I don't actually know enough about Leviticus to hold that title, but OK, let's do it. <coughs> so I am now one of the, the ten most influential lay Catholics in the country, um, only, only behind Jacob Rees-Mogg, which I think is much more impressive than number three in The Independent. So there's a kind of pressure to think very differently about how we talk about this stuff. And I think that we are in great danger as a nation and as a world to, to lose sense of our civility, to lose sense of being kind to each other, of seeing the best in each other and working with each other to build a movement and a community that actually advances rights. And the thing that is happening in this country now is an absolute pathological fear of difference and otherness. And because of that fear, we are seeing that played out in relation to trans, but actually it is something that is happening universally. So we've got to take the lessons from the LGBT movement, think about the wider community, but also think about how we individually can think differently about how we build communities and movements, however that looks. And that doesn't have to be a left-wing concept or a right-wing concept. It's actually about how we build bridges together in order to make the world a better place and how we have good disagreement in those communities with respect and humility. So those are my kind of very short observations. And, and what I do want to reassure you about is I've not been fired because I like trans people and I've not been fired because one donor stopped donating. Like if, uh, if I was going to get fired for one donor stopped donating, they'd have I'd been fired a long time ago. So Stonewall is an organisation that is constantly trying to push these boundaries, but that is not without its difficulties. But really tonight, I want to be able to hear your questions and I hope I'll be able to answer them and fully and frankly, as, as helpfully possible. Thank you. And thank you so much on that. But I wanted just to pick off from where we left off. So I think you've rebutted a lot of the claims in the media this week about your resignation. But is there any truth behind any of the allegations that there has been a rift or there has been difficulty within Stonewall and the movement because of your stance and methods promoting transgender rights? I think, I think there is... It's an interesting one. I don't... I'd, 
There has been quite open disagreement with how Stonewall has pursued trans rights, and, but that isn't a result of my resignation. So, so this isn't new. And what's really interesting, I was reading Derek Jarman's diaries the other week. He's an amazing writer, if you've not read Derek Jarman. And on the founding of Stonewall, he said, Stonewall is an elitist um, organisation that is not working from the movement. So gay people not liking how Stonewall works is not a new issue for us. So every campaign we've run, there's always been division within the community. Stonewall was set up as a non-democratic organisation designed to provide a very professional lobbying organisation. And that, that pissed people off and always has done. There are some who wish Stonewall would take a more um, ambivalent view on trans issues. So the best way to summarise it is that there is a whole group of people who think trans women are men. And that to us is base offensive. There is a group who think trans women are trans women, and Stonewall is very firmly of the view that trans women are women. And what some LGB people would like us to do is create more space to think about the fact that trans women are trans women. And that to us is fundamentally at odds with our mission, our purpose, our belief, our support for trans people. And it really reminds me of the times when we were pushing for Catholic adoption agencies to accept same-sex couples. And there was a really good argument that Catholic adoption agencies shouldn't be obliged to take same-sex couples. And nobody at that time went, well, on the one hand and on the other, it's all a bit tricky. Shall we have both sides of the conversation? And I remember being on Radio 4 once talking about this, and I said, we are not the Oxford Union. It is not the job of Stonewall to create a debating chamber as to the rights of trans people. It is the, ro the role of Stonewall to advocate very firmly of the belief that trans women are women. And I think it would be a great disappointment to the majority of our supporters, many of whom are big employers, big supporters, who would be appalled to think that Stonewall would concede that there is an issue of debate around trans rights. And I think that the, the, majori the majority are in that position. There is a vocal minority who'd quite like us to be a bit more, well, it's all terribly tricky, isn't it, and hand-wringy about it. And I'm afraid I'm not having it. So that's where we are. But that hasn't led to my resignation. What's led to my resignation is 14 years <laughs> of doing this work, and I'd quite like to do something else. So within Stonewall, on this issue, <coughs> do you think you have managed to create a civil discourse for disagreement and for discussion about it? Or within Stonewall, has there been...? Within Stonewall, the organisation? Yes. Well, Stonewall, Stonewall, the organisation, is constantly talking about what our policy positions are. So, for example, we, you know, we're 165 staff from massively divergent backgrounds and diverse perspectives. We've got a board with massively divergent views. So we would have a conversation, for example, about what do we do about prisons? So the conversation about... So we would accept that trans women are women, right? That is not up for debate. But what do we do about prisons? And the starting point of that conversation is, is that trans men should never go in a men's prison, right? So we know that trans men should never go in a men's prison. So we are conceding that there is space for flexibility around some of this stuff. So what does that mean in relation to trans women in women's prisons? What does that mean in relation to people with a very sexually violent past in relation to... So, so we're talking about all these issues all the time. What we're not doing is going on Twitter going, trans women are all evil and they shouldn't go in women's prisons. And, and I think that there are people who'd like us to take that position presume that because we won't take that position, we are incapable of any kind of reflective thought. But we're a very bright bunch and we talk a lot. So there's a lot of discourse and a lot of discussion about how we think about some of these issues. So how then, to a wider audience at large, I mean, the movement at large, how do you think you can try and move the discourse yeah. into reflecting that same kind of civil? Well, it's, it's really difficult because what's... So we work with a company called Build Up, who are peace-building companies who work in the Sudan with people in the north and south of Sudan, right? So they, they are good at tackling difficult, intractable problems. And we work with them on our strategy. So we're all about building the middle ground. And to give you an example, we commissioned research with uh, domestic violence organisations and said, look, we don't really mind what the answer is. Just tell us, tell us your take on this and where you're at with it. And we published a report that didn't reflect Stonewall's views. So Stonewall's views would be X, and actually this report reflected a whole bunch of different things. Not a single media organisation picked up on it or wanted to report on it, because it was just too subtle. You know, it was too nuanced. It took the views of 25 different organisations and gave a quite an interesting reflective view. And what they want is 140 characters of all trans women shouldn't be allowed in domestic violence centres. And it's just not like that. So it's a real challenge for us about how we cut through some of that stuff. 
The Sunday Times writes three negative articles a week um, and have printed apologies frequently. Um, the Times writes negative articles about trans people pretty much every week. So there is, a, there is an absolute unequivocal anti-trans agenda and it's quite hard to get some cut through on that. And it's done through individual conversations. But what I also have to reflect on, Stonewall's 30 this year, and it's taken us 30 years to get to this point on LGB. We've been doing trans for three. So it's going to take a bit longer. Then I wanted to talk about the 30 years, indeed your 14 years at Stonewall. How do you think that the type of activism undertaken at Stonewall has changed since you began? 30 years ago. Or 14 under your... I mean, thir what's interesting is that 30 years ago, um, the organisation at the time had no traction whatsoever. And it's very easy. Section 28 came in. I know you're all too young. Section 28, piece of legislation, prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools, exactly like the legislation being introduced in Russia, right? So 30 years ago. So there was no um, popular support. There was no newspapers. The articles would talk about terrible things happening in schools. So Stonewall had a really hard time. It had to go to Europe to get the right for gay people to serve in the military. No way that would happen in British law. It took until 2001 for Europe to insist that this country didn't discriminate in the workplace. It took until 2004 for Tony Blair to say, I will now introduce a catalogue of changes. So, you know, 89 to 2004 before we had a government who was willing to play. So the work at the time in that section was very much about trying to find individuals with some power and influence who might help move things forward. It was really slow. 2004 to 2014, much faster. And what happened then is that businesses and organisations started coming on board. So we were working with Barclays, IBM, you know, all these kind of big players, but we presented a very nice version of gay. What happened now is that we do both. So we are, we are still advocating very carefully, but we look very smart while we do it. So I can go from a meeting with um, the chairman of a FTSE 100 company, <coughs> and I walk out and I put a hoodie on and I talk to a youth group. Right? So there's a kind of, there's a chameleon nature to Stonewall's lobbying in that we talk about matching the client a lot. So you kind of, you know, you, you, you move to match the client. What's difficult is in a social media world, it's harder to, to split your message. So you could kind of sort of do one thing to this group and another thing to this group. And now you kind of have to do the same thing to each group, which is why Stonewall's, a lot of Stonewall's work remains below the radar. So my social media, you won't tell from my social media who I've had meetings with. You know, I will never go, here's me with a minister and this is what we've discussed. Here's me with, you know, everything is still very low key and below the radar. So some of that still remains. And Stonewall remains considered to be one of the most effective lobbying organisations in the country. I mean, we, we achieved our founding mission in 2014 and we continue to move the needle, but also because we're not, we, we don't have any reliance on government funding. So all our income is unrestricted. So when I took over in 2014, we were on 4.5 million, We'll close this year on eight and a half million. That growth, um, so that doubling of income is all unrestricted. What I mean by unrestricted is we get it and we can spend it on whatever we want. You won't find charities like that. So Oxfam isn't like that. You know, big, big government grants determines their activity, whereas Stonewall has massive freedom and that's a big drive. So then looking forward to the next 14 or 30 years in the future, do you think the lobbying will again be more under the radar and more intimate or where do you think the movement goes in Stonewall phase? Well I think we always talk about when Stonewall will cease to exist mm. and I think every charity should have that conversation so when will we know we've been successful and when will we close down is a live question and in 30 years if we're still going I imagine it will be because we are looking at a much broader spectrum of issues so we'll be looking at race, disability, gender, sexual orientation but I also think the challenge going forward there's some really basic new challenges like sport you know, a lot of the conversations I have in sport context are the conversations I was having in 2004 with this place. So, you know, some people are gay. Gay is when two people really like each other and they want to be with each other. You know, kind of really basic conversations. Forget non-binary with the Premier League. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's all pretty basic. Um, but looking at international stuff, it'll be much more of that Stonewall way of diplomacy. So those quiet conversations, those nudging. So if I look at some of the work we're doing, it is about mobilizing some of the companies working in Poland, for example, to influence from a, an economic perspective around some of the rights and responsibilities. You do not want 
Stonewall with a banner outside that door. What you do want is Stonewall underneath it, nudging and influencing. So, so that principle and that way of working will remain, but possibly who we're influencing will change. Then I wanted to, off that, talk about the role and responsibilities of allies yep. within the LGBTQ movement. Is it right that they have such a prominent role, even if they are effective, or does that undercut from the authenticity and the, and the united element of the movement as a movement of itself? I where are the role of allies? It, I mean, I, th I, think, I think that it, it, it's not an either-or. So, so the LGBT community, in the same way that the black, Asian and minority ethnic communities should be able to self-organise and advocate for themselves without that being appropriated. But there are far more allies than there are people belonging to those minority groups. And it is incredibly powerful. And I think, it, I think we talk a lot about privilege. And actually what privilege is about is power. And in any given situation, someone has power and someone has no power. So I can go into a room and have absolutely all the power in that room. And sometimes I can go into another room and have no power. And when I have no power, what I need is the people who have power in that room to advocate for me and go, actually, we have power here, so we need to make sure that Ruth is heard in this setting. And when I'm the one with all the power, I have to think, hold on a minute, that Asian kid at the back of that room hasn't been brought in yet. He feels like an outsider because everything about that room says he's an outsider. How do I use my power to bring him in? So I am being an ally by being aware of my power. And, and what allyship is about is about understanding power. Often it is seen to be performative or tokenistic or non, you know, just kind of yay go rights. There's some work we do with some organisations where we're teaching, supporting gay men to call out sexism. So gay men who are in a room of majority men where there's a woman around the table is more likely to notice that that woman has been routinely ignored and written off because he's been in that position himself. So by helping him say, actually, I don't think Sandra's finished making her point yet, is incredibly powerful. But we also do quite a lot of work with, for want of you know, heterosexual men who talk about the moments where they felt like the outsider. You know, the moments where they have felt like they are the one with the least power in the room. And connecting that idea has been transformative in all sorts of different contexts. The problem is, is that in, in, in some contexts, that's, there's still a basic understanding of that, which is, um, you know, ev nobody feels like they have more privilege than someone else, ever. It's not an effective influencing strategy to talk about privilege. Then I wanted to now just take a moment and look back on one of the most uh, historic moments of someone's history, the legalisation of gay marriage. What was it like, and what was your experience of the passing of that bill? leading up to it after it and how do you refocus or well i i mean i was a um i think i was deputy ceo or, or director of public affairs so i was mainly worried about the amendment to the fourth reading on the back bench of the lords and whether it would be defeated with an amendment that was wrecking so so i was slightly in the micro lobbying stage of that what's interesting is that we actually consider civil partnership in 2004 far more historic so the, the Civil Partnership Act in 2004 was a real game changer because what it acknowledged that same-sex couples were legitimate and were allowed rights. Marriage was the first piece of legislation that didn't come from the people, but came from legislation, came from Cameron wanting to put clear blue water between the other side of the party, wanting to piss off the Liberal Democrats. I mean, so it was all a bit of gaming going on that was quite interesting from a lobbyist perspective. So my reflection of that time was it was quite an interesting lobbying time. Um, with a lot of games being played. But I think that grandmothers knowing they could see their grandsons being married was incredibly important for rights and was a big game changer in terms of public attitudes. And I think that's why the, the refusal of churches to even consider it is a real shame because you know the Church of England has got a major PR problem and major numbers problem. Why would you not want those handsome gay boys? to come and get married and bring their nan with them. Do you know what I mean? So there's a kind of real short-sightedness in some of that stuff. And then with the repeal of Section 28 being over 10 years ago now, why do you think in the classroom especially, sex education is still so heteronormative? Well, I think, I think it's interesting. So schools have made massive progress, but not in relation to sex education. So schools are really, I mean, we work with 2,000 schools a year and they are really good. They put our posters up, they talk much, much more openly about LGBT stuff. They cannot talk about sex. But part of the issue is they can't talk about heterosexual sex. So there's a, there's a block on sex. You know, we are, we are not teaching girls about 
the clitoris or female pleasure or you know we're not talking to boys about anything beyond kind of basic STIs you know we're not talking about relationships or what good relationships look like so Britain is utterly backward when it comes to talking about sex so then extending it to same-sex relationships seems to be absolutely beyond their ken so what's happening now what's really interesting is that we used to talk about sex and relationship education we now talk about relationship and sex education so the, n the new thing is not SRE it's RSE so we talk about relationship and sex education and the government is struggling to articulate what it means by that. So what do we mean by good relationships? What is a good relationship? They're struggling to talk about pornography. They're struggling to talk about the role. So, so it's easy to kind of think that that's a gay twitch. And actually, it's not a gay twitch. It's a sex twitch. And actually, when it comes to inclusion of LGBT stuff, we're doing much better on it. So Archbishop of Canterbury says, you know, boys should be able to wear tiaras is is considered quite a normal thing, you know, but schools phone us up and say, we've got a boy who wants to dress up as Elsa from Frozen. What should we do? And we say, well, generally kids outgrow Frozen, even though it's really annoying. And they kind of go, but what should we do? Does he need to see a psychiatrist? And we're like, just buy more Elsa costumes. Like, chill out, just buy more Elsa. So there's a kind of, there's, a, there's this more exploring of that. But as a country, we are still terrible about talking about sex. And one of my key concerns is although HIV seems to be going in decline, there will be a new HIV, there will be something else. And as a nation, we, we still are not good enough at talking about some of these things well. So on an issue like that, how do you approach it from an LGBTQ standpoint? Do you start and recognise that actually you need to kind of lead the conversation in terms of heterosexual or do you wait for that or how do you no, decide? We, we, we start about what, what is good conversations about relationships. How do we talk about relationships? What is a good relationship? You know, and, and is it important? So it, the first question is, is it important that we talk to young people about what good relationships look like? Yes, says everybody. What is a good relationship? Treating people with respect, making sure you're honest. So what does it mean when someone who is gay feels obliged to marry someone of the opposite sex and hide their sexuality? Is that a good manifestation of relationships? No, it's not. Would it be better if that young man could talk about being gay? Yes, it is. OK, bingo, there we are. So, so Stonewall always takes very gentle steps in, of which reaching the LGBT point comes quite... So sport, we talk about performance. And we talk about the fact that lying is toxic. Secrets are toxic. If you are keeping a secret, it affects your performance. And to be in a position where you are not keeping that secret, your performance will improve. Whether that is because you're having an affair and that's a secret, whether it's because you're really worried about um, an eating disorder, whatever your secret is, it's affecting your performance. We accept that as a truth, then you can start talking about sexuality. So it, so it is always about taking the wider perspective. And then just continuing off when you're talking about HIV a moment ago, with the NHS being so slow to react, do you think that the burden of promoting PRP and PrEP, the young sexually active men, is unduly put on the charity sector rather than the government itself? Yes, but the whole response to HIV was unduly put on the charity sector. Um, so my, my partner, who's a bit older than me, she was a buddy when she was at university. She supported men who were dying of HIV. She volunteered. You know, it was utterly reliant on students <laughs> to support gay people who were dying of HIV while the state was putting out posters with tombstones on it saying that gay people are killing people. You know, th so, so the charity sector has always been the one responsible for running some of this stuff. And it is, again, a kind of inability to see the bigger picture around preventative health messages. It's the same thing about the HPV vaccination. So we kind of get to the place where it's probably worth giving girls the HPV vaccination. Let's give the HPV vaccination to boys. Let's just prevent some of these, some of these cancers before they start. But it's, 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 a, it's a limited perspective on what's, what's real. And there will always be an over-reliance on the charity sector to plug those gaps. How do you think you can... Is there any space in lobbying to try and change that aspect of government policy or does that come after is it about changing attitudes first or specific policies there there is a changing of attitudes there's about getting greater diversity within parliament mm. but it's always about longitudinal stuff so it's a bit like um, how does change happen in the union it's very hard for change happened in the union because you all work on termly bases so nobody in the union is ever going to go what's our 10-year strategy for reform in the union even though you have some of the finest minds in the country, no one will ever take a 10-year perspective. You'll only ever at best take a three-year perspective, sometimes a term. You know, so what can you do in a term, right? 
So it's the same in government. So you have you know, it's a situation where you've got a group of people who've got a limited amount of time. You're determined by your campaign grid and you're determined by a general election. Can you really make decisions that will have an impact on health outcomes in 10 years down the future? That's why we're in a climate change mess. No one will ever really take responsibility for a long-term consequence. And then uh, on the union point um, specifically, our LGBTQ office has been working a lot to try and improve LGBTQ experiences in the union. Then how do you think traditionally exclusive and elitist societies can improve to being more welcoming to minority, society, minority groups at large? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is like just... just uh, if, if girls could stop wearing the dresses, that would be amazing. That would be my big top tip for the union. Um, I mean, I, I've always, I, I, I think that um, Oxford in particular thinks it's, uh, I love Oxford. It, it, I, it was the first time I was able to be myself. I was able to be smart, arrogant. I was able to learn and think and fly. And if I hadn't been president of the student union, I wouldn't have been CEO by the age of 34, right? So, so everything I say comes from a position of absolute love for this institution and everything about it. But the union and the university as a whole presumes it's a meritocracy. And it presumes that it, that it can work on the basis that it only ever attracts the best without really understanding the fundamental barriers that exist to that. So the union prize, you know, what is the, what is the mission of the union? The union is the bastion of free speech, the bastion of good quality debating, high quality thinking, really strategic insights into some of the thorny issues of the day. You will not achieve that if you are only getting a certain percentage of type of students who want to come into your doors. So you will fail in your mission. And, and I think that the union has been slower to grasp that. And, and the, if the union wants to, if you think about the debate that happened in wartime, you know, if the, if the union were to have that heyday again, it has to have the people in that chamber who are thinking differently and asking more challenging questions. So it's fundamental to mission. And I think it's that connection that places like the union, places like the student union, places like the university really struggle with because there is an assumption of fundamental equality and, and accessible meritocracy. I completely agree. And then my final question before we move over to the audience is, you've been an incredibly experienced and effective advocate for LGBTQ rights and I'm sure a lot of people in this room especially will be very sad to see you leave Stonewall, but what do you have next? Do you have any thoughts about what's coming up? I'll tell you in three weeks when the Sunday Times isn't watching. Um, so main, uh, I'm not being coy about it, but what I am doing is, is something quite exciting, but I can't use Stonewall platform to promote it. So I've got to be a bit careful. So everybody thinks it's, it's um, I'm being quite mysterious, but uh, well, I'm likely to be doing something um, that is slightly more business orientated and, and uh, very much in the same sphere, but, I shouldn't be using a, a, a platform afforded to me as CEO of Stonewall to promote that. We'll say it when the cameras are off. Yeah. Uh, so is there a first question from the audience? Yeah, let's come to the hand here. Would you like to stand when the microphone gets brought to you? I was wondering, perhaps, your opinion on whether you think gay pride has lost its way, whether it's become sort of taken over by token companies, and the fact that you have to pay to go to these big after parties and things, perhaps is lost its well, maybe had its time and the money's better spent elsewhere now? Um, I think, so, so prides in general is, is what I presume you mean rather or than... Or sort of maybe perhaps the bigger London, Manchester, Brighton... Yeah, I mean, uh, Stonewall's had its moments with Pride in London because uh, Pride in London considers itself a party and I think there is enough politics to be at the heart of it. I don't mind the commercialisation as much. I don't mind companies spending £30,000 on a bus if that's how they want to spend their money, to go to a party, that's entirely up to them. Um, but I think there is a place for politics. So I would love to see the LGBT group of Uganda <laughs> fronting up the Pride in London march, or the trans youth groups at the front of that march, rather than absolutely fabulous. Do you know what I mean? So, so for me, that, but that, that's, I don't run Pride in London, so who am I to say? But when I look at something like UK Black Pride, which is LGBT people of colour event the day after London Pride. It is the single most amazing, heartwarming, political, transformative event I've ever seen. Because you see young people who have never met or seen anyone like them suddenly in a space where they are entirely able to be themselves and are not frightened of racism from their own community and are meeting people like them. And that is what Pride for me should be about. Trans Pride in Brighton is similar. And when I go to things like Norfolk Pride or some of these little local prides, it's exactly like that. 
So I think we have to think, well, what's special about that and how can we retain it in some of these bigger prides? You know, Manchester Pride, Brighton Pride, they're, you know, it's like going to Love Box or, or Reading Festival. Do you know what I mean? So fine, good luck to them. Like, why shouldn't they make money and gays feel proud of that? Like, what? But so how do we retain some of what's special about some of those prides and make sure we don't lose that? And I think, I think that's the challenge. But what I'd also say is lots of prides around the country are run by volunteers. You know, the Oxford Pride is run by people who have, don't have a salary. It's hard. They've got to get permission from everyone left, right and centre. So it's not an easy thing. But I think we have to think about what is the purpose of Pride. And that's why UK Black Pride is incredibly powerful for me. And I'm really, we've announced a partnership with them today that I'm really proud of. Thank you. Yeah, the Oxford Pride is still very good. It's yeah. Charity based. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But 70 quid to go and see Ariana Grande at Manchester Pride, like, well... Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump to another question. Then. Yep, sir, in the back. Um, to what extent do you think um, religion affects people's attitudes to uh, LGBT rights? And um, I guess to what extent do you think uh, religion forms a barrier to the work that Stone will do, and uh, do you think that attitudes are changing with respect to um, uh, people uh, holding religious views and also supporting the rights of uh, LGBT people? Yeah, I mean it, it, that's a that's a big question. And I, to what extent is faith used as an excuse to be homophobic frequently? To what extent is genuinely held faith a barrier to to inclusion? It's not. Uh, so there's a big difference uh, between those two things. So generally, faith communities and people of faith take a very different view on inclusion to faith leaders who are looking for a way to demonstrate their difference on all sorts of things. So Church of England um, is mainly having a fight about the communion and whether the Church of England in Africa should split away from the Church of England and whether there should be a big split. They can't have that fight, so they fight about St. Paul and they fight about um, celibacy and they fight about gay clergy. And actually, that's not what they're fighting about at all. And when you strip it back, you can kind of get to the heart of that. So the inclusive church movement is incredibly successful and doing very well. And everything I do with the Church of England is, you know, to what extent should kids who've been part of congregations all their life still feel part of that congregation? And most people are quite consistent on that. But when you ask them about whether St. Paul felt that celibacy was better than marriage and therefore gay people should always be celibate, that becomes a really interesting philosophical um, conversation that actually has nothing to do with the kid at the back of the congregation. So to me, it's about understanding the difference between human lived experience and compassion and love and on the other side, politi politics, for want of a better word. So this, I think this is the most middle class thing I'm about to say. We've, we've got a great guy company who come and pick up our suits once a week and dry clean them and bring them back. Right, so shh. And um, it's very hard being me. Um, so um, <laughs> these guys, Haz and Kaz and, and Ahmed, come and pick up our suits and they love me and my partners. Like, we love your suits. We lo We're going to their wedding. Uh, they get married to, to his wife and it's great. And I was like, do you really want us to come? You know, we really stand out. It's quite clear we're gay. It's a big, big Muslim wedding. We don't want to embarrass you. We're so pleased you've asked us, you know, but he was like, oh my God, my uncle's gay, his sister's gay, they've adopted a kid who's gay. Like, you know, what do you think? Is, there won't be any alcohol, like, but literally chill out. And I was like, you know, we make, we make so many assumptions based on, on reading cues about saying, you know, it's, it's a big Muslim wedding. Obviously, two dykes in our three-piece suits are going to really stand out. And they know all our clothes. So they're like, we want you to wear that three-piece suit. I was like, we can't have it. So there's a kind of, um, I think we overcomplicate these things for ourselves in a way. And sometimes it's about humanity and civility. And I think that there's a lot to be done. I, I think in some countries it is being used as a way of differentiating between Russia, um, ISIS, um, Global North, and I, th I think that homosexuality, and I use that word quite deliberately, is a, is a shorthand for saying where you stand on certain issues. And, um, and, and that, is, that is very dangerous, but that's not to do with God. There's no God in that. I know that seems like a long answer, but it was a very big question. Um, and I hope that answers it to some extent. Then have we got another question? Yeah, we'll go the hand. 
Hi, thank you so much. It's been really interesting um, listening to everything you have to say. I was just wondering, um, on the topic of spaces for queer women um, and their disappearance, do you think that's a sign of progress, that the community is becoming more integrated and it's not so much about sex and gender, or do you think it's a sign of reg regression um, and something that we should be worried about? I think it's a sign that queer women never use queer spaces. Like, that, I, I, like we, can, we can make a wider political observation, but so, you know, I remember when the place opposite here, right, this is way before you lot were born, this used to be a queer women's club across the road. And it was great, but there used to be three of us, like literally <laughs> once a week. It is big space. We used to have three of us drinking our Budweiser, do you know what I mean? And there were three bars in London and nobody used to go to them. So there is something, and that is happening with the gay male spaces as well, but that's been replicated on Grindr. That there's that that's not being replicated. There's no find her, right? Do you know what I mean? So, so there's a kind of how do we, how as women are we organising? And I think part of the backlash about trans women is in part that anger about where is that queer women's space? And, and you know, where are... Where is the lesbian visibility? One of the things I find most difficult about the Times and the Sunday Times, kind of going, oh my God, what about the lesbians? It must be so hard for the lesbians who are all like being forced to transition. It's like, you have literally never reflected me once in your pages. You know, you, you do not talk about lesbians. You do not talk about lesbian experience. It is, you, you rarely see women who are not in a heterosexual relationship with children depicted in any of the mass media or popular group. So there is something about lesbian and queer women's visibility that is of grave concern. I don't think we have to worry about the spaces so much. I think, I think there are other things to be, to be worried about, in my view. Then have we got another question? Yeah, jump the hand in the corner. Hiya. Uh, you mentioned the uh, media's hostility to the transgender movement, uh, but kind of on a more micro level, uh, what are the arguments and methods that you would use uh, when you encounter someone who's like very sceptical of the whole transgender thing? Yeah. So, so that it, it comes a bit down to those two camps. So those who say trans women are men, like that's a kind of difficult one to even get into because that is so biologically determinism. The answer to that is that nothing is that determined. So there are people who say that I am less of a woman than my mum because I've not had children. There are people who would say, so if a woman is born without a womb, does that mean she's less of a woman? How do we determine where is the line? What are the parameters? So, so that has to be fought on a biological determinism front. The more tricky one is this bit here. Trans women are trans women who say it's all very difficult, isn't it? And the arguments there need to really come down to, well, what does the current law say? The current law says that if someone identifies as some being in the gender that they say, they should be treated in the law with the utmost respect and be treated and deemed to be the gender they say. There's then a lot of confusion about the Gender Recognition Act. So the assumption to get a gender recognition certificate is that you have to have surgery, you have to be kind of really sure, you have to be really pretty. You know, it's just nonsense. You know, you have to, at the moment, live in role for two years. You don't have to have any surgery. You don't have to have any hormones. You have to submit a dossier of evidence to a panel who you'll never meet, who will determine whether you are trans enough. And you have to be diagnosed with something called gender dysphoria. So very few trans people go through that process. So this obsession at the moment with, well, have you got your gender recognition certificate is a really poor one because it's irrelevant. The second point I make is that a lot of this is about class. So if you have money and you are able to transition in a way that someone finds socially acceptable, they are more likely to be accepted as a woman. So therefore, someone who can't afford 500 pounds a day for hair removal, who can't, isn't healthy enough, um, is, isn't the right age to have any kind of surgery, is deemed less of a woman than this person over here. The third point is that you are more likely to be convincing by those standards if you are able to go through this process when you are pre-puberty and the person you're speaking to will be dead against that. So if they're dead against someone having treatment before puberty, then they've got to be okay about the broader shoulders. <laughs> you know, they can't have it both ways. The fourth point I make is that this heightened gender policing is having a negative impact on all of us, that I am, um, and not just when I'm dressed like this, but, but me and my partner in particular are questioned much more than we ever were about being in spaces. So we were in um, Liberty the other day, that's the second middle-class thing I've said. Um, <laughs> 
and we were both just in the toilets and a woman came in and went, you're both in the wrong toilets. And we were like, no, no, we're definitely in the right toilets. Like kind of really heightened breasts out moment. <laughs> and um, she followed us out and she went, I'm so sorry. And we're like, no, no, it's totally fine. Totally understandable. It's all okay. So like very British about it. And she went, have you thought about growing your hair? And it was just so this kind of enhanced policing that is going on about what counts and what doesn't and this obsession about what constitutes a safe space. And, uh, and the toilet cubicle is not a designated safe space. It's this assumption that women walk around women's toilets pulling up their tights and changing their tampons. Do you know what I mean? It's like, we do have privacy in these cubicles. Like, can we all just relax? So it is about talking about the reality and the lived experience of what we do. And there are three areas where it's complicated. Prisons, sport, domestic violence centres. Like, those are the areas. Everything else is just about fear and anxiety about the other. Those who think trans women are men, I wouldn't even bother. Leave that to us. And then let's jump to another question. Um, just moving on to that, I was wondering what your thoughts were <laughs> on the no platforming of figures like Jenny Murray. Um, so let's talk about no platforming first and then talk about no platforming Jenny Murray. So I, l I love this new thing about no platforming that you all think it's a really new thing. I think it's really cute. So, so a little story. Um, so when I, was, when I was here in 2001, there was a ritual in that every term the union president would, would threaten to invite someone controversial and every year the student union would mount, a, mount a, a campaign to stop the president inviting someone controversial and the president would back down at the last minute and it would all be like terribly exciting for everyone involved. Uh, we'd all have very good stories to tell in our job interviews the year after about how we'd all stood up for our principles. Okay, so that, that is as old as time, um, debates about what we do. Now, in my day, what we used to say is, uh, the Oxford Union is a very established organisation. It should be discerning with its platform. You know, it's a, it's a, so, so who you give your platform to, we should be mindful about. That has been translated into no platform in, and actually it's not no platform in. Who you choose to give your platform to is something you are discerning about, so how do you exercise that discernment? Right. The extent to which you don't invite people who hold views you don't like, again, depends on the context. Would I invite Jenny Murray to a trans session discussing trans inclusion? No. Would I invite Jenny Murray to come and talk about 50 years of broadcasting and the role of women in media? Yeah, I would. You know, so who, who are you using where to talk about what is incredibly important. I think part of the problem is, is there are some really poor speakers out there who have some interesting ideas that make people think they're going to be interesting speakers. And my fundamental point is from a position of intellectual disdain of stupidity, so why do we give platforms to people who are stupid? Because actually, you know, all, all that is doing is making a point about the platform. Have an interesting speaker who's got an interesting thing to say. Don't market it as an LGBT event. Don't market it. Give people the choice to come or not. Be clear about that. Make sure you've got robust challenge. So Luke Trill, who was president in 2003, who I adore, and he's a great lad, he, he took it to the line. And he invited David Irving and a guy from BMP and it was all like, oh my God, he crossed the line and he invited them and they were police outside and all this, you know. Like, I know you think it's, it's all done the first time for you, I promise you, it's come before. And it was a really shit debate. Like, it was a really disappointing, just like, nobody was very articulate, nobody said very much, because the interesting thing was the debate itself. It's like, we are smarter than that. So by all means, invite Jenny Murray, but hold her to account and at least do something interesting with it. So th I think it's how we do these things and how smart we are about it. And then, sir, we have a question there. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us an idea um, of moving forward, how the issue of, say, um, where at what age will we have to will we you know draw the line with uh, giving uh, allowing you know children the choice as to say transition, obviously. Um, you know that the right thing to do is in the case of the LGB is to let your your child figure out what they're what they're more comfortable with yeah and um, there's there's no real hindrance to that apart from prejudice but in the case of say s transitioning um, between um, you know sexes and so on I know it, like people see this as a lot more controversial and and there are actually implications in terms of taking hormones and so on so I was just wondering 
if you had any thoughts of what would be the ideal um, scenario for the future and how to tackle the issues at hand there. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happens with kids. So, so just to kind of lay it out first, what happens. No child is given hormones until after 18, ever. No child goes through surgery until after 18, ever. What happens to a child is when a child has a very strongly expressed and consistent um, want to present in the opposite gender, the best thing you can do for that child is let them. So, and that, there's a whole spectrum of that from letting my godson Louis dress up as a princess as much as he wants, but he's very clear that he's Louis. He's got a friend who sometimes wants to be a girl and sometimes wants to be a boy, and therefore, and we go, great, whatever you want, all the way up to Michael, who doesn't want to be Michael, really clear from the age of three he doesn't want to be Michael, and goes to school as Sarah, and is treated as Sarah all the way through schooling. And that happens quite a lot. And they have a lot of therapy, and they have a lot of family therapy, and they're talking to people, and you know, all sorts of things. Like It's a really long decade. What happens is they then go to secondary school, and Michael, who's been presenting as Sarah for all of their primary school, suddenly goes into secondary school. And in secondary school, it becomes much harder. And suddenly, Michael is being forced to go through puberty. His body's changing. Her shape is changing. She's being forced into ch sports she doesn't want to do and changing rooms she doesn't want to be in. And that's where you see suicide. And I'm sorry if that's upsetting for anyone in the room. That's where you see half of young people commit suicide. So what do you do in that situation? The most humane thing you do is let her carry on being Sarah, right? Like, why would you make her not do that? The second thing you can do is delay her puberty. And by delaying her puberty, you give her more time to think. So that is not without consequences. But the alternative is that Sarah goes through major puberty changes. And that is so distressing that it's just unbearable. So you just pause. And then when Sarah turns 18, she then makes an adult decision about whether she wants to take hormones and whether she wants any surgery and da, 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 da. So that's a bloody long time, right? So the controversial decision is, do you let Sarah take a, take a puberty blocker pre-puberty? And the medical view is, yes, you do, because the alternative is unbearable and it is reversible and you can take them off the puberty blockers. And if they change their mind, then they go through puberty as their body determines. So there's a lot said that kind of imagines that three-year-olds are kind of having major intervention surgery and testosterone. Do you know what I mean? So in fact, it's pretty safe. Where it gets tricky is people who haven't demonstrated any trans views until they're about 15, 16, and then want very quick treatment. And the problem is you go from a children's service to an adult service very quickly, and the adult service is easier because they think you can. So what we would like to see is more provision for the 12 to 21, and we would like to see identity services. We'd quite like to see a place where anybody can go along and go, I think I fancy girls and quite like wearing trousers and I quite like climbing trees. And someone goes, do you know what? That's absolutely fine, kid. Where are you at today? So we need more provision for kids of all ages and identities to talk about who they are and their identity. That is, that is more of a concern about provision. Does that make sense? So uh, as far as I understood, you had would the, the only kind of sort of biological intervention that you would advise you would advocate is a, a blo um, puberty blocker yeah. um, at around the age of 15 or, or, or so on yeah. nothing more than that and you would advocate for just tracking the individuals or for there to be a lot more kind of support and, and, and monitoring around around the individuals the most important thing is that kid is allowed to live as they want to live so it's when that person is forced to be something they're not but th there is not mass hormone dishing out to kids, it just doesn't. It doesn't happen. No, not now. But I was just wondering if if, if this should if it should always be the case. I don't think it's been advocate. I don't think anyone's saying it should be. I think what it's saying is that puberty blockers should be available so people can pause. And people are worried about puberty blockers. And then the d the decision to do that should that lie with the with the child themselves with with the the people in the services, the therapists or the well, parents. Well, I think, it, I think it's Gillick competency. So the so Gillick competencies determined that it's not about age, it's about the stage of the person. So if the person is able to express that, so, th so there's a difference between w transitioning and receiving your GRC. So as I said earlier, you don't need surgery, you don't need hormones. 
anybody who has surgery or hormones should be going through a process of discussion and, and consultation with a professional who can talk to them about it. So, so there is no age. That's not an age thing, really. That's the stage of life you're at. So if I had a decision now, I wouldn't be able to just rock into a hospital and go, actually, can I have the testosterone? They'd go, can we have a chat about this first? So I would expect there always to be a level of support before any kind of medical intervention that had a permanent life-changing effect. Um, and th what age that happens, for Michael, who's been doing that since the age of three and has been on puberty blockers and has then got a meeting at 18, I'd kind of hope that at 18 he's getting what he needs quite quickly because he's kind of proved himself. It, it'll still be probably probably be difficult legally to decide who has the ultimate choice there'll be like disagreements between the but individual it is, about, it is about contraception it is about abortion it is about so that's what the gillet competencies are about we, we often have problems determining who has enough agency maturity responsibility to make decisions about what kind of life they want to lead and what changes they want to lead that's why we can't marry until we're 18 except in Scotland. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's not a new dilemma. And the, it's not a, so a similar question comes up about um, RSE, actually, relationship and sex education. At what age can a child say, actually, I do want to go to this, even though my parents want to take me out? So parents for faith grounds might go, I do not want my 17-year-old learning about same-sex relationships. A 17-year-old might be perfectly competent to say, actually, I'm able to make my own decision here and I want to be in this classroom. Should that be eight, nine? 10, 12, you know, at what age is a child able to say to their parents, actually, I'm willing to have this information? So, so it, it is a, a live issue of which trans is one element, I think. Yeah, you had a hand on the front row. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. I was just wondering, in this age of kind of um, Orange is the New Black and um, films like The Black Swan and um, Gay Best Friend, for example, whether yeah. you think this kind of popularisation and like Netflixization of um, gay culture and what it means to be gay, whether you think that that's harmful in kind of reinforcing the idea of a good gay, or whether you think it's kind of progress in terms of opening up debate about issues of homosexuality, being bisexual, being trans? I think it depends on the programmes. So Orange is the New Black is a really good example of actually genuinely showing the lots of different ways in which you can be a woman and which you can be a queer woman and in which there's different ways to be gay. You know, there was, there was more than one type of lesbian on that show and there were bi people on that show. But I think Orange is the New Black is an outlier rather than the mainstream. Um, I think Netflix is a massively good force for portraying queer identities in mainstream ways. But I'm older than you, so you've got to bear in mind that my experience was Beth Jordash on Brookside Anna Friel, sorry, my throat's gone, kissed a girl and killed her dad, right? So that was my one locus point for same-sex, girl-on-girl action on the television, right? Has anyone seen Sex Education? So Sex Education's amazing, right? And, and, I, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but what's interesting about Sex Education is it had two teenage girls who were both lesbian, had been best friends for ages, thought they should get it on because they were both lesbians and had a shit time. Like, I have never seen that depicted anywhere. And I, so many of my adolescent relationships were like that. It's like, you're gay, I'm gay, we clearly need to get it on, even though I'm not remotely attracted to you, right? So, like, that is such a, that is such a next stage of queer female portrayal. I can't be anything but joyous about that. And w there was one weekend where I watched Disobedience and then I watched The Favourite, which was Rachel Weisz getting it on with women twice <laughs> in a row in two films. So that only can be good for me. Do you know what I mean? You know, Olivia Colman getting it on with Rachel Weisz and getting an Oscar for it. Like, this all feels good. But I think the key to it is about that diversity. So ensuring that there are black LGBT people in these shows, ensuring that there are genuinely good trans portrayals. You never see trans men in these shows. You never see non-binary people in these shows. So it's kind of making sure, but I think Netflix get that. I don't think the BBC gets that. And I don't think Channel 4 gets that. So what is the kid at home watching? They'll be watching what their mum and dad are watching. And their mum and dad are watching Endeavour. They're watching, you know, Morse. They're watching Vera. And the depictions of same-sex LGBT portrayals in that are still very one-dimensional. So for me, the campaigning objective is how do you get Vera to actually have a non-binary character? Do you know what I mean? That, that, that's, that's a concern. And then I think we've got time for one final question, so I'll put the hand here. Hi.
Hi, good evening, I'm Ali. Um, like here we are talking about, let's say, level 9 or level 10 about the rights and all the details. Um, let's talk about, for example, third world developing country where it's still level 0 where the government won't support this kind of things. Even the NGOs won't support this kind of things. Even yeah. there's no social mentality about the project or about anything about the LGBT, even LG, not LGV. Yeah. Um, maybe only some Facebook pages or things like that. So what's the key point or what's the roadmap building in your experience? It's a great question. So, so about 20% of Stonewall's activity is international and we do it in four key ways. The first is influencing British government to ask better questions and be discerning about the conversations they're having. So we will talk to the Foreign Secretary about what's happening in Chechnya, for example, ensuring that he can use his influencing power. The second plank is about taking our learning from the last 30 years and sharing it with activists in other countries. So we do a lot of work with Russian activists and with um, South American activists and African activists. We've got a big program where we work with uh, queer women from Africa, queer women leaders, helping them kind of use our materials and resources. The third is about taking our programs that we sell and giving them to those groups, teaching them how to sell it so they can sell it and make money for themselves. And the fourth is about educating our activists and supporters to stop being so white and imperialistic about it. So British activists are like, oh my God, like, why aren't you just doing what we did? And why aren't you campaigning for same-sex marriage? So a lot of people say to me is, what are you doing about ISIS? How are you going to get Russia to secure same-sex marriage? And I'm like, well, the activists in Russia are not prioritising same-sex marriage. The activists in Russia are doing X, Y and Z. And then making sure that, that Stonewall doesn't get in the way of that. So what often happens when there's an international thing is no global north LGBT groups take the headlights, uh, headlines. So what we do is we step away and then we make sure that the Russian LGBT group gets the headline. So we'll link the Guardian with that. You know, so, so it's all that kind of work. But it's also about understanding that we can't determine what that activity looks like. But some of the best work we do is around the military. So I think the key legislative change that happened in Britain was allowing LGBT people to serve in the military. It's interesting that the first thing that Trump has done is stop trans people serving in the military. And the thing is that when you allow LGBT people to serve in the military in your country, you humanise them. Because even if you hate gay people, the fact that your neighbour's son is willing to die for your country instantly makes you respect him. So war is a much better civil rights tool than marriage. So a lot of what we do, and when I go in with sergeant majors, big tall guys who are like proper butch, and they go, actually gay people are a real key part of our, our war effort, it's singularly more effective than when I say it. So there's a lot of things like that we can do that nudge, that nudge those needles forward. But the demand for our work internationally is far greater than we can deliver on at the moment. Well, thank you very much, and that's a very poignant end. Unfortunately, that is all, all we've got time for, but ladies and gentlemen, please do join with me in thanking Ruth Hunt.